In the first and second part of the history of Islam, we talked about the establishment of the Khalifat by the first Khalif Abu Bakr and the expansion and implemented reforms by the second Khalif Umar. However, before Umar's death, a committee known as the Shura was established with the purpose to select a new Khalif and to seek the approval of the Muslim community known as the Ummah. From the two leading candidates, Uthman and Ali, Uthman was elected as the third Khalif. And even though Uthman in his own words was not an innovator, he certainly was a reformer. Prior to his conversion to Islam, Uthman was a wealthy merchant from an influential family known as the Umayyads. In fact, his father was one of the richest people in the city of Mecca. Uthman inherited the wealth of his father at the age of 20, who by then had passed away. But being a skillful merchant, Uthman had managed to multiply his inheritance many times over and thus earned the nickname Uthman the Wealthy. Before his conversion to Islam, Uthman never drank nor smoked, and despite his good looks for which he was known as Uthman the Handsome, he didn't chase women. When Uthman converted to Islam, it enraged his family. Over the years, the Umayyad family members under the leadership of Abu Sufyan would turn out to be the most anti-Muslim faction within the Quraysh tribe. Uthman's two wives denounced him for converting to Islam, and so Uthman divorced his wives and married one of Muhammad's daughters. Later on, he would take one more of the Prophet's daughters as his wife. The early Muslim community was certainly pleased to have such a wealthy man in their ranks, and Uthman helped his fellow Muslims in any way he could. Usually this meant through financial support. For example, Uthman financed the immigration of a group of Muslims to Abyssinia. He spent lavishly on public facilities such as expanding the mosque in Medina and donating wealth to the public. Enormous wealth good looks, and married to two of the Prophet's daughters. Uthman had it all, and it is exactly because of his good fortune that Uthman was a man driven by a sense of guilt. He spent much of his time fasting, praying, and reading the Quran. Every day is doomsday, Uthman once said. This God-fearing and guilt-driven man would become the third Khalif of the Rashidun Khalifat. Welcome to Caspian Report by me, Shirvan. In the lifetime of the second Khalif Umar, the state had expanded tremendously. Islamic social institutions and Islamic jurisprudence was taking shape, and the reign of Umar was filled with discovery and adventurism. When Uthman came to power, he had to collect taxes, repair bridges, run courts, set salaries, and manage all the dull affairs of the Khalifat. But in history, more often than not, the smallest and the most dull decisions can have the most profound long-term effects. For the Khalif, the first order of business was to settle the state's finances. This was, after all, what Uthman knew best. Prior to this, state expenses were not recorded or even calculated. And even though a state treasury and other financial institutions did exist, Uthman fully reformed and streamlined the whole system. More than ever before, the taxes of the Khalifat flowed through the capital, and it was the state that financed state expenses. With this, the Khalif had further centralized the authority of the Khalif and the capital Medina. Over the next few years, Khalif Uthman dramatically increased the state revenues and he did so by reforming and replacing the provincial governors. For example, when Amr ibn al ahaz the conqueror and governor of Egypt, could not sufficiently provide revenues to the capital, Uthman had him replaced with his own foster brother Abdullah ibn al sahad the former governor, Amr ibn al ahaz strongly objected and stated that the new governor, Abdullah, was abusing his authority by oppressing and starving the local Egyptian population just to increase the flow of revenues. But since Abdullah, in a short span of time, had actually managed to double the amount of revenues from Egypt, replacing al ahaz as the governor 
seemed to be the wise financial decision after all. This set forth a precedent during the reign of Uthman. Soon the governors of the provinces of Kufa, Bashra were replaced as well, and over time the Khalif would replace more and more governors with people he trusted and knew were capable. But it happened to be that the people Khalif Uthman trusted and knew were capable were usually members of his own family, the Umayyads. After the replacement of the Egyptian governor, Uthman made one more significant financial reform. He changed the previous Khalif's prohibition of Muslims confiscating lands in the conquered Christian and Jewish territories. Uthman, being a merchant, believed in economic freedom. So he changed the ruling and allowed Muslims to purchase lands in the conquered territories. Uthman further stimulated the land purchases by giving out state loans to Muslims to finance the endeavors. In a relative short time, the Muslim elite purchased and acquired valuable lands throughout the Khalifat. One group benefited from this arrangement more than the others, Uthman's own family clan, the Umayyads. Since his relatives were already wealthy and well connected throughout the state, the Umayyads had an easier time taking out loans from the state treasury. In the meantime, the economic overhaul by Uthman turned out to be so enormous that it stimulated a construction boom throughout the Khalifat. Paved roads were repaired and expanded, new canals were dug, irrigation systems were improved, new ports and bazaars were constructed and regulated, about 5,000 new mosques were constructed. Uthman the Wealthy, Uthman the Handsome had become Uthman the Builder. The Khalifat was prosperous and the Khalif was mostly admired and respected by the people. Mostly, but not by everyone. During the reign of Khalif, numerous revolts broke out in the former Sassanid territories, most notably in the provinces of Fars, Azerbaijan, Sistan, Tabaristan and Khorasan. The revolts eventually ended through various methods. Some regions accepted to pay a tribute some settled for autonomy, but some regions, for example in Tabaristan, the local population was crushed, enslaved and massacred. In brief, the reconquest of the former Sassanid provinces was actually bloodier than the initial conquest during the reign of Umar. All in all, the Khalifat had made minor territorial expansions during the reign of Uthman. That is because the Khalif was no military man and he left all the military affairs in the hands of the local commanders. Essentially, the Khalifat only reinforced the territories conquered during the reign of Umar. The only significant military development was the establishment of the Muslim navy. The governor of Damascus, Muawiyah, using the local expertise, had constructed a large naval fleet, one that was meant to rifle the Byzantine navy. Through the new navy, the Khalifat conquered the islands of Cyprus, Rhodos, Crete, Sicily, and according to some historians, even established small colonies and trading outposts in the Iberian coastlines. However, the most significant military engagement was the Battle of the Masts, in which despite overwhelming odds, the Khalifat's new navy decisively defeated the veteran Byzantine navy of the Lycian coast. It utterly shifted the power balance in the region. The Khalifat was no longer just a land power but also a naval power that could go head to head with anyone. One major important Islamic undertaking that was completed during the reign of Uthman was the definitive edition of the Quran. The final book was compiled by the length of verses and all the other versions were destroyed, and this led to some scholars to accuse Uthman of a conspiracy to alter the contents of the Quran. The definitive edition of the Quran would later on be copied and spread throughout the world. This is the same unchanged Quran that Muslims use today. The Khalifat's overseas voyages, the Sassanid revolts and the definitive edition of the Quran all took place in the 12 years since Uthman took the office of Khalif. However, as always, the Khalif was driven by a never-ending sense of guilt. Uthman had lived mainly on bread, water and prayer. 
while over the years his Umayyad relatives had slowly but assuredly become the economic and political powerhouse of the Khalifat. They governed the biggest cities and trading centers, they owned the most valuable lands and had the largest financial assets. One particular Umayyad member stood out the most, the Khalif's favorite cousin Muawiyah, the very same person who had constructed the Muslim naval fleet. In a decade's time, Muawiyah, the man who started out as the governor of Damascus and its surroundings, had expanded his influence through political intrigue, royal marriages, land purchases, trade expansions, and through gifts by the Khalif. In a decade's time, Muawiyah's territories expanded to include everything from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean coastline of Egypt. Furthermore, he had assembled a large standing army and a naval fleet loyal only to himself. What you have to understand here is that Muawiyah's influence and power expanded very gradually. It didn't happen overnight, but over the span of 12 years. When you live in the present, this kind of developments are very hard to perceive. Over the course of 12 years, the admired Khalif Uthman was now receiving objections and complaints from all over the Khalifat. Financial extortion, corruption and heavy taxation were the leading grievances. In Egypt, Uthman's foster brother Abdullah, the very same Abdullah who had replaced Amr ibn al ahaz as governor and of whom al ahaz had warned of, was extorting the local population so severely that riots had erupted. The local Egyptian traders, merchants and notables formed a coalition and wrote a letter to Khalif Uthman asking for the dismissal of the governor. Some time went by and the notables received no answer in return, and so they decided to send a large delegation to petition the Khalif in person. As this took place, other delegations were sent from other provinces such as Kufa and Bashra as well. On their way to Medina, the crowd of people had combined their strength under the Egyptian delegation. Before the Khalif had even realized it, a large group of angry citizens were knocking at his door. The delegation argued that a decade's worth of extortion by Governor Abdullah was enough. They wanted a change of authority. Initially, Uthman did not want to face the crowd and had asked Ali to go out and speak to them on behalf of the Khalif. But it was Ali who convinced Uthman to go outside and address the people's legitimate complaints. And that is what happened. Uthman addressed the Egyptian delegation, he promised to replace his foster brother in Egypt and sent the delegation home. The issue seemed solved and a crisis was averted. As the Egyptians were returning home, along the way they noticed a particular suspicious man. They approached the man and searched him. It turned out he was a servant of Uthman who was carrying a letter for the governor of Egypt. As the Egyptians unfolded the letter and read the contents, their whole world came crashing down. The letter stated that as soon as the delegation showed up at the court of Egypt, Governor Abdullah was to execute the entire delegation. It was seemingly signed by the Khalif himself. The Egyptian crowd, feeling betrayed and abandoned by their own Khalif, returned to Medina with a fury. Uthman came out to meet them on the steps of his residence. The delegation showed Uthman the letter and the Khalif was stunned. Uthman swore by God that the letter wasn't his and he had never heard of it until now. Historians point out that the letter was in fact written by Uthman's cousin Marwan who was a relative and an ally of the governor Muawiyah in Damascus. What you have to understand here is that the Khalif had no bodyguards or whatsoever. The army was kept in the provinces and on the front lines of the state, and the capable men of the city were on their pilgrimage to Mecca. The only protection the Khalif had were a few local young men posted at the Khalif's residence. Among them were the two sons of Ali, Hassan and Hussein. The events following the interaction between Uthman and the Egyptian delegation are quite confusing and contradictory, but what happened afterwards is certain. As the dispute went on, the situation escalated. The delegation approached the residence of the Khalif for the second time, 
and then someone shot an arrow and killed one of the crowd leaders. The mob was enraged and demanded that the Khalif bring forth the one who shot the arrow. Uthman refused to do so, stating that he could not betray a person who acted in his defense. The crowd then demanded that the Khalif resign from office, but once again Uthman refused them, and instead the Khalif left the talks and retired to his private chambers and did what he always did, pray and read the Quran. Outside, the crowd, overwhelmed with anger and a sense of injustice, turned to violence. They broke down the door of Uthman's residence and burst in screaming, and there they found Uthman settled in the corner of his study room with a little lamp, reading the Quran. At the age of 80, the Khalif of the Muslims was beaten to death by his fellow Muslims. For four days the angry crowd rampaged through the city streets of Medina, plundering and looting the citizens of the city. What had started out as a legitimate peaceful delegation through conspiracy a sense of betrayal and injustice turned into a furious mob of rebels who threatened the very core of Islam. At the end of the fourth day the mob leaders demanded a new Khalif, one they could trust or else they would launch a devastating storm of death and destruction throughout the city. The mob gave the citizens of Medina one day to elect a new Khalif. At these turbulent and desperate times all heads turned to one person, the one person who had been passed over time after time. Some had always called him the Prophet's only legitimate successor. The Muslims of Medina had elected Ali, Muhammad's son-in-law, as their new Khalif. Initially, Ali had refused the honor. But when notable members of the Ummah pledged their allegiance to Ali and begged him to take on the office, Ali had no other choice and so he finally accepted the title of Khalif. The fourth Khalif faced an immense challenge. Ali was tasked with ending the rebellion and restoring justice and then there were some who were calling for vengeance for the assassination of Uthman. Blood must be answered with blood. The loudest of these voices was that of Muawiyah and the Umayyads, who back in Damascus had raised their banners and soldiers. Through political intrigue and conspiracy, Muawiyah and his Umayyad allies would lead the Khalifat to civil war and essentially end the democratic structure of the Khalifat and forever change Islamic civilization and identity. This and more we will discuss in part 4 of the history of Islam. For now, this was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. If you've enjoyed this video and if you're looking for ways to support Caspian report, please take a look at our Patreon page in the description. Thank you for watching this video. Take care and sahul.